Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for uh, taking time out to watch the film and join the panel. Um, my name is Mary Featon. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy, 22 years, and um, my uh, mission for Warfighter Advance grew out of watching my, uh, we call them shipmates in the Navy, but watching my shipmates um, go down to psychiatry and uh, be drugged and um, have their outcomes uh, become worse. So they basically, they deteriorated. Um, and after watching this for a while and attending uh, enough funerals, you know, just realized that something's got to be wrong with what we're doing. And um, so we started Warfighter Advance. Um, a lot of the people on the screen are um, people who've come, come almost from the beginning to help. And uh, I really uh, appreciate them taking the time to help with this panel. All right, so we'll introduce everyone else. We have Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Ruby. He's um, a retired member of the United States Air Force. He's a psychologist and ISEP executive director and author of Smoke and Mirrors, How You Are Being Fooled About Mental Illness. Next we have Kathleen. She's an MS 500, R I'm sorry, master's degree, 500 RYT, which stands for yoga teacher training. Some, you know, some special things she'll explain in a minute. She's also a biostatistician and an epidemiologist and a yoga instructor. Lastly, we have Katie Johnson, Warfighter Advanced Subject Matter Expert on Neurofeedback and Related Technologies, and she's owner of Chesapeake Performance Brain Technologies. So I'd, I'd like to just pass to each one of you and just kind of um, introduce yourself a little bit more in detail than what I just said, and maybe some initial reactions to the film if you are just seeing it again for the first time you know, in a while, um, and anything you want to say. Let's start with um, Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Hammett and I'm a biostatistician epidemiologist and I teach yoga at Warfighter Advance. So they start their day with me at 6.30 a.m. Um, I have a history of post-traumatic stress, pretty significant, which is not military related, but medical related. Um, and I, I was on all the cocktail of medications and I met Doc V and she's like, nope, <laughs> you're not crazy. You don't need that. And, you know, this is where we should go with this. And I love using exercise and movement to help people get off their medications and, or just, you know, help them ease through transitions in life. So that's my story. Um, next, let's do Katie. Hi, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I have a son who was diagnosed as atypical Asperger's as a third grader. He, um, he had actually two brain injuries as a toddler and a preschooler. And we went down the long path of trying to figure out what was going on, not knowing that those brain injuries had done some significant damage. Uh, we ended up with a psychiatrist who diagnosed him as atypical Asperger's because he fit under no one particular category. And that began the medication train. So he was on a number of medications, anywhere from Depakote to Zoloft to ADHD um, medications. And I was a special education teacher before having him. My husband was military and I followed him around. So I stopped teaching when we got married and began to move around the country and the world. But uh, as time went on, he didn't get better with those medications. It got worse. We did find our way to a neurologist who continued the medications, but also introduced us to neurofeedback. And that's how I got into neurofeedback and saw major changes and met Doc V around that time or not long after. And uh, that was also when I was getting involved, more involved in neurofeedback. And she introduced the um, drugs, maybe your problem. And so our son actually read that and he was 16 or 15 at the time and uh, was very well read. And he had a massive <laughs> um, breakdown about these medications that he was on and took a whole summer, uh, probably a little faster than he should in some ways, but got off three different medications that summer and has been medication free ever since. But the neurofeedback, thankfully, 
uh, throughout all of his school years helped him, and he is now on his way to being a very compassionate paramedic. So uh, I became involved with Warfighter through Doc V during that time period. Thank you so much, Katie. And Chuck, would you go last? Sure. Um, I'm Chuck Ruby. I'm a 20-year Air Force veteran. I used to do work in counterintelligence, counterespionage, and criminal investigative uh, <coughs> matters when I was in the Air Force. I retired in 1999, and uh, because of the opportunity of being selected for advanced training while I was in the Air Force through the Air Force Institute of Technology, um, I was able to go to Florida State for four years to get my PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, when I retired, uh, I went into private practice in Southern Maryland, where I still am now. And somewhere along the way, I bumped into Mary Feeton, uh, fortunately. Uh, in fact, I think I, I co-opted her to join our group, the International Society for Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry, to work on a program we had at that time to help veterans uh, who were suffering from uh, PTSD. And um, the rest is history in terms of her involvement with ICEP. She's now the chairman of the board of directors for us and doing a great job. When she, uh, when she and I met, she asked me to get involved with Warfighter. And so I, at each retreat, I present a, a lecture toward the end of the, uh, the week. Uh, and interestingly, that lecture turned into the book that I just published, Smoke and Mirrors. I, I started writing uh, from my PowerPoint slides to give a handout to the participants. And it became very clear very, very quickly that it wasn't going to be a handout. There was just too much information there. And um, so it turned into the book. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, this is, I think, the third time I've seen this documentary. And every time I see it, I just get really pissed off at the, the way that uh, our profession relies so much on medicalizing um, problems in human living. So glad to be here. Thank you so much for, for all of you for introducing yourselves. So we have a few questions rolling in. Um, again, I just want to say if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A. But I'm going to read this first one um, and then combine the second one so we can just have a discussion. Uh, the first one is, I am a retired lieutenant in the Israeli Defense Forces with post-traumatic stress from Desert Storm in 91. Luckily, I didn't take medication and had to heal myself with bioenergy treatments. Now I have a 19-year-old son in early psychosis, cannabis-induced, sorry, cannabis-induced psychosis. We are not going the medication route. I have been treating him with neurofeedback, herbs, homeopathy, and more. However, this requires a lot of resources. It takes courage to say no to the psychiatrist and visits with him are just incredibly upsetting. What are your suggestions for alternative treatments? But I also want to get into, you know, what is psychosis? What is these troubles that people have? What, you know, so let's talk about all of that. Doc V, anybody? So, uh, yeah, I would, I would like to say um, before he takes another step in this world, he should get a copy of uh, Bob Whitaker's book, The Anatomy of an Epidemic, which is, um, Bob Whitaker was in the film. He um, spoke so well. Um, but boy, does he do a good job of um, talking about the issue of psychosis. Um, and um, the, you know, and, and I also think it's, it's, a, valid, um, it's a valid step um, since the psychiatrist has nothing to offer you except for medication. It is absolutely a valid step to stop attending those appointments, um, you know, and, and use your time more wisely and less frustratingly to um, pursue the things that are helpful. Um, you know, the things like, um, things like marijuana and, um, psychiatric medications are known to induce psychosis. And sometimes it can take a very long time for that to resolve. Um, but, um, you know, I, I guess the main thing I would say at this point is hang in there. And I think you're on the right track. Yeah. If, if this is, if this is strictly a substance induced psychotic reaction, uh, then it would be, uh, it, solution would be far different than if this was maybe a combination of that plus just what we call psychosis when it occurs. Um, I'm not real clear by the question whether that, which one of those is the case, but if it's, you know, psychosis, the, the, the name psychosis sounds very medical. Uh, it's used as a, a name for a symptom. In effect, what it is, it's when someone is faced with so much 
intense emotional pain that they basically break free of what had been some kind of consensual reality. Uh, and it's their attempt to make sense of things that otherwise aren't, they can't make sense of. And so again, they, some, you see people breaking free of a, of a consensual reality, acting very disorganized, maybe hallucinating, maybe thinking things that are very different from what other people think of. And in those cases, it's important to have someone for that person to explore that pain that's going on, not just think in terms of trying to treat the so-called symptom, because the symptom isn't a symptom like a medical symptom, again, unless it's, this is substance induced completely. Uh, the the so-called symptom of psychosis um, is basically one's complaint about life. And that complaint needs to be listened to and addressed to try to find some way to resolve it if possible. Uh, Katie and Kathleen, I'm wondering, since you kind of act, asked, they asked about alternatives, can you kind of talk about what you've seen in your practices in the work that you do with veterans, with, you know, outside of veterans, just like the transformative power of alternatives? Yes. So um, sometimes with neurofeedback, depending on what stages and phases the brain is going through from withdrawals or, if it, you know, someone's gone back on something, uh, street drug or medication, whatever, the brain may not be quite ready for what's known as traditional neurofeedback. It may be a little too much for it and, it, and it's not ready to train um, because it is, uh, as you know, probably teaching self-regulation for the brain, but sometimes it's just not in a state of it. And you may want to um, try taking a break sometimes and then also you know, look at your, your daily water intake, fresh air exercise, which Kathleen will touch on, um, nutrition, you know, what kind of processed foods are going on. And if you're already doing all of that to the best of your ability, um, you know, not a perfect diet every day or um, exercise and fresh air, but, but really working towards it, then sometimes the brain just needs a little bit of break from that training. And then there are also so many products on the market now that maybe uh, the brain may need uh, something a little bit different, like pulsed electromagnetic frequencies in a very gentle form just to help coax and calm down the brain. And then you can go back to the neurofeedback training and the brain is a little bit more ready for it um, at that point after some other uh, things happen with the brain. So there, uh, you're free to contact me through Angie if you would like, if you would like to know about some other, other products on the market. Um, I've learned about quite a few of them. Of course it is costly, unfortunately, but sometimes you need to try something a little bit different. So from my perspective in exercise, I find whenever you get people moving, especially if you get them moving outside, they're much happier and it's almost immediate. Like after one week of daily exercise for 30 to 60 minutes, like gentle walking, especially outdoors, you see an instant change. Sleeping better, routine, a time and a place to do something, you know, a schedule. So these things that are, you know, some people associate with, you know, we don't want to be too rigid, but sometimes that rig rigidity of the schedule really helps heal as well as the exercise and you begin to look forward to it. I know when I teach yoga classes, sometimes if someone holds all their tension in their neck or all their tension in their hips and their glutes, you get them stretched out through their hips and their glutes and all of a sudden they're sobbing. You know, they go like, <gasps> Oh, like I haven't felt this or, you know, maybe it just takes them back to that tense place when you release it and they're sobbing and it's like, they've never stretched. They've never taken an hour to just stretch their muscles and you get them in a, you know, in a nice position in child's pose and you're pushing on their back and all of a sudden it's like, Whoa. so there's, and there's a lot of research that goes into the chemistry in your brain behind that. But again, do we really know? We can see what happens, we can see the results. And without medication, that's how I got to a place where I sleep, I eat, I perform and function like a human being. So for me, it was magic. 
I just have to add, Kathleen, that during the filming of Warfighter Advance with, you know, me and Dave were there, you did a Tai Chi or Qigong routine. I don't remember, but I have had that, like, I have the song downloaded and I wish you would like record that and make it available for the public because it was so good and it felt good and it wasn't like too strenuous, like, because a lot of people when they come off of psychiatric drugs, it's, they can't run a marathon. Like these people can barely get out of bed, but right. it was like just enough to make me feel pretty good. So I just want to thank you for that. Oh. Um, that great. I'll teach you. you will have to zoom. You can please, learn your- will you please give me a personal <laughs> class? Okay. I love it. Anyway. Okay. So our next little set of questions is about uh, finding a doctor and this, this, this might be for Chuck and Doc V, but um, kind of like when people want to come off medication, first of all, there's lots of reasons why people want to come off. They could be having adverse effects while they're still on them. They could be wanting to give birth. They could be experiencing sexual side effects. There's lots of reasons. Okay. Um, But then when they go to a psychiatrist and they say that it's taken as a sign of, you know, lack of insight, or that's a, that's another symptom of your bipolar disorder that you think you can be okay without your meds. So can we kind of talk about that, um, that, hamster wheel, but also like, how do you find a doctor who understands this or that will help you get off? I'll I'll go first, Mary, if you want me to. Um, I've had several cases like this where someone wants to get off. Either they uh, had the idea themselves and they come to me for that reason, or while they're working with me, they discover that these these drugs are not correcting any kind of chemical imbalance because there's no chemical imbalance to correct and they're astounded that they've never been told that so um the problem that angie was talking about could be called the official term is anosognosia which is allegedly a symptom of many mental illnesses basically any of them and it's when you don't agree that you are mentally ill meaning you don't have insight into your mental illness and your denial that you're mentally ill is a symptom of the mental illness. It's a very big catch-22 problem. Um, and so when you want to get off your drugs, the, the prescribing psychiatrists, many of them, call it that. They see that as, as a problem. Your, your insight is, is uh, uh, defective. And so sometimes they refuse to help you wean off these drugs, which to me is malpractice. If they, if they prescribe them, they have an obligation to give you safe uh, weaning instructions. If they don't, you could also go to any kind of physician who can prescribe and ask if they would help. I had one uh, person who I worked with for quite a while who had been on clonopin for 20 years, uh, twice a day, two, two doses, morning, evening, on clonopin for 20 years, which is just criminal. Anyways, she was able to find a neurologist that was willing to help her on the, on the medical side to supervise the, the uh, tapering off of the drug. She worked with me also on tapering off of the drug. We came up with a year long s- specific schedule where she would cut back so many days at a time. And it took her a full year to finally be free of the drug. Still, to this day, she has these sparks and other kinds of physiological uh, after effects of the drug. Uh, I think, I don't know, and and maybe uh, Dr. Featon would would know, but I don't think anybody has sued a psychiatrist or any board has brought um, uh, an investigation against a, a a psychologist, I mean, for helping people taper off these drugs. It's been questionable whether we as non-physicians can do that, but frankly, it's not rocket science. It's, you, you really don't need a medical degree to know how to taper off of something slowly. You just need, you need to know mathematics and how to take something in half or in a quarter and so forth. Uh, I like to find some prescribing person who is willing to supervise the whole process just for my own safety. Um, but it is possible to get off of them uh, if with effort, with a long, very, very slow uh, tapering schedule as Alan Francis said in the, in the documentary. So the only thing I would add to that is that um, I, I, I have the same issue. The psychiatrist says no for all of the, the reasons above. Um, and um, what I tend to do is go back to the person's general practitioner 
they usually have a very long standing relationship with that person and I'll, I'll call them and I'll actually um, work out this sort of a cycle where they're, they're managing the patient, but I'm managing them. And I, you know, I feed them the information, I feed them the taper schedule. I, you know, give, send, I send them the books um, so that they, they know that what they're doing is um, solid, good practice. Um, and then the only other thing I would, would say is there's a, a robust literature uh, on the internet ab about how to taper and how to taper safely. Um, but there's also probably 10 times more crap. So um, be very, very careful what you look at um, and who put it up there. Um, Warfighter Advance has a, a list of psychiatric withdrawal websites that we um, we prefer, and they've been vetted by um, most of the people on our staff and um, the people who we know that have uh, had to use this and, and taper. So um, I'm, I'm happy to make that list public if anybody wants it. Um, but it has everything from, you know, how to get off of Paxil to how to get off of gabapentin, which by the way is as safe as rat poison. Anybody is on gabapentin, you should be scared. It's my advertisement for the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we also have on our website a whole list of the, the knowledgeable um, withdrawal websites. And to me, it was shocking with a psychology degree when this happened to me that, oh my God, patients are tapering themselves because the medical, you know, has left the building on withdrawal. The UK is a lot more advanced than we are. It's now written into their NICE guidelines and ICE about um, people experiencing extreme withdrawal reactions. I think it's about like 65% based on their recent research. So they're, start, they're, they're probably 10 years ahead of the US and it kind of bothers me that the American Psychiatric Association has not said a word on withdrawal in spite of the UK releasing all of these things. So yes, um, on our website, we have some too. All right, um, next, let's see. Someone wants to know about nutritional psychiatry. So maybe we could talk about all these new ALF branches, um, nutritional psychiatry, holistic psychiatry. I remember Doc V saying something to me when we were, maybe do you remember when we were in the, when, when you were in St. Louis doing the PTSD workshop and I, I'd mentioned someone that was now a holistic psychiatrist and you made a comment back to me. Do you remember that? No. No. It was just something about like, so they can't get you off, but then there's going to be a whole field that can make money off of getting you off. Like that doesn't, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, what is going on here? Anyway, so any comments about nutritional psychiatry, holistic psychiatry, maybe functional medicine, naturopaths, anybody have any thoughts? So, you know, again, if it's got the word psychiatry after it, you know, leave the room. It's, I think it's that simple. They, they are going to give you a label, you know, they're still going to say you have major depression or, or bipolar disorder, and then they're just going to feed you right. But you, you're, you cannot get away from the, the label, you know, go see a nutritionist. And um, let the nutritionist help you and, and not label you in the process. They can deal with the exact same um, issues. They can help you feel more up, less anxious, um, more energetic, lower your blood pressure into the bargain. Um, you know, so why bother with the psychiatrist? I, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah, I echo that. It's, and I like your, um, Angie, your comment that they, they, um, they create one one industry to take care of a problem with the other part of their industry, uh, but you know that human beings function on a basic level because of three fundamental things. Uh, first one is exercise, second one is sleep, and the third one is eating. And if any one of those three things are out of whack, you might as well forget about going to see a therapist or definitely not a psychiatrist until you get those three things in line. And I don't mean going to the gym every day. I don't mean being a, a you know, health nut or anything like that. I'm talking about basic things, especially sleep. If you don't sleep well, that in itself can be a really big problem. And the, the spinoff problems from that get, end up getting labeled all kinds of diagnostic categories, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, you name it, you can label uh, any of those things. But those three things have to be relatively intact before you try anything. And so nutrition is part of that. So I want to echo that. The psychiatrist, go to the nutritionist. Yeah, exactly. I want to, I also want to echo that about those three things, because 
um, a lot of times military people will come to me and they'll say, you know, well, I'm hearing things that, you know, I shouldn't hear. And, you know, all these crazy things are happening and I'm anxious and, and they sleep three and four hours a night um, mm -hmm. and, and poorly. Um, and then I'll say, well, have you ever been to SEER school? You know, that's where they train you to be a prisoner of war. And, um, you know, they'll say, well, yes or no, but they all know about SEER school. And I said, well, one of the things they do there is they sleep deprive you. And what happens when they sleep deprive you? Oh, you start seeing all kinds of funny things. You start hearing all kinds of funny things. And then I said, well, what happens when you go home from SEER school and you get a good night's sleep? Oh, it all goes away. So where does the psychiatrist come in again? <laughs> you know, you know, improving your sleep comes in. And I know I haven't had a new client last week that hadn't slept through the night probably in 20 years. And um, I got him this a medical device called an alpha stim. Um, he used it one day, slept eight hours that night. And, and literally the next day he came in and said, like, I can't believe how I feel. I haven't felt this way since I was 17. And, um, you know, and he, the VA was planning to put him in an inpatient uh, setting. Um, and he needed sleep and he got it and it changed everything. So um, it, I check what you said is absolutely correct. You, the basic body functions first. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna piggyback on this with the nutritionist because I, I walk with a nutritionist a couple hours a week, <laughs> several hours a week. And we talk about this. And one thing to really look for when you're going for that nutritionist is a naturopathic certified nutrition specialist. A nutritionist is more to, you know, give you a diet for diabetes or for your heart. Whereas these naturopathic certified nutrition specialists, they will look at your blood work. They will look at your vitamin D, at your serotonin, at your dopamine, and they will create a diet based on that. And the, it's just amazing when you start eating for your health and for your mental health, the difference it truly makes. Um, there are things we can eat for our mental health that are not part of our normal diet. And even just the way we cook them or combine them, getting the inflammation out of our body, we feel better, we sleep better. And some of those withdrawal symptoms are not quite as severe. And I think that's really, really important. The difference between a registered dietitian and a certified nutrition specialist who went to a naturopathic school of nutrition. So I just wanna put a little clarifier and you can usually find those in chiropractic offices. I would like to also piggyback off if that's okay. Please do. So I had a client who came to me um, for severe restless leg syndrome and um, her psychiatrist had put her and your, no, her neurologist had put her on gabapentin for it to calm it down. And when I, when I do an intake or a consult, I always ask, what are your daily habits, nutrition, water, all of that. And she said, well, um, I start drinking coffee when I wake up and I drink a cup of coffee every day and every hour until 8 p.m. <laughs> but her neurologist never, ever asked her about her caffeine intake. And so within three sessions of coming to me, I had coaxed her into, you know, a cup of tea at 8 p.m., herbal tea, and then a glass of water between each cup of coffee. So then she wasn't drinking quite a cup of coffee every hour because she was more hydrated. And then we realized she didn't need to come to me. And so I do actually turn business away from myself <laughs> because I would much rather you go the, the least restrictive, you know, route versus mm -hmm. someone coming and saying, well, I didn't really need to come to you after all. Um, so I, that's why I always make sure I ask quite a few questions in an intake to say, Hey, maybe you should just try a few of these other things first. And I'll, I'll piggyback as the person with lived experience. I know everybody probably does, but I'll just say from my perspective, um, I, when you come off of medications and you're left kind of by yourself, you have to relearn how to take care of yourself. You know, this is part of the journey. Like, okay, what, when I eat this certain foods, how do I feel? And I have to say that, um, I've stripped down my diet to like super strict to, you know, sugar carboholic and everything in between to kind of experiment, like what makes me feel good? What do I feel bad? And I can just say that the general public underestimates what food does to the body. 
but it doesn't take like, I mean, it's a personal thing and some people feel great on vegan. Some people are great on keto. Like it's, it's up to you to find what feels best to you, but that has absolutely been part of the journey of like what exercise, what kind of people around me, what kind of support systems, what everything has been, you know, I've had to like dismantle it and figure out what is going to work for me. Dogs, like this dog is ridiculous. I'm so sorry about this dog. Anyway. Okay. So this next question is one of my favorite topics. Um, basically the person says, what a great movie in the film, Bob Whitaker mentioned how part of the issue surrounding medicalizing normal is our cultural understanding that sadness is taboo. That is to say that our society insists on cheerfulness. As such, doesn't this cultural component impact informed consent when patients are actively seeking a magic bullet for their problems? So can we talk about what is normal and what is a normal reaction to trauma versus a pathological reaction to trauma? Uh, so the PTSD thing, bring that in if you can and just this discussion of normal and magic bullets. I'm gonna start, I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna start because I was horribly, horribly traumatized on so many levels and it, it doesn't even matter. There's a whole story, but the trauma was consistent and it was about eight years long. Um, and I can just tell you that the more doctors I saw, the more doctors they told me to see and the more doctors they told me to see. And it just becomes this continuous cycle to the point that you're going to therapy, you know, to talk therapy and you're like, well, what am I going to talk about? And you do begin focusing on that negative. Like, oh, I need to talk about something negative so I can fix it. And once all of that goes away and you're left with yourself to fix the problems, I found it to be with, and Doc V watched this path with me. So I, I mean, I did have her, so the talk therapy probably changed when I met her to something more of, well, how are we feeling while we're not taking so many pills? Um, until I was off everything and I was on the full, I had a good list, didn't I? pretty good not the bit not the biggest by any stretch like maybe, maybe seven or eight um but I got off of all of them and I used the exercise I used diet I used meditation and so I just want to say that you know in answering the I'm not sure I'm answering the question but as the traumatized person quote unquote like we don't even want to say the word death in our society you don't even see that in obituaries it's they passed and it's it is it's this hyper happy culture that we're in that we can't even say someone died you know we we can't say that something, something bad happened you know we whisper it and so i think the more we normalize that somebody died and i feel horrible that people will be like oh that's normal and i think that getting back to that place would be amazing because i don't think i would have taken a single pill had someone just said you died for 20 minutes like you should feel horrible but nobody said that. And so I just want to, if we could get that into the medical schools, it would be fabulous. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, the issue of abnormality versus normality is a false issue. Uh, there is no such thing as either. That is because, now I, I realize in practice, people say it's abnormal, but each individual gets to determine when it's too much not abnormal, but too much, and then to seek out help. But even from a scientific perspective, we cannot identify what normal is and what abnormal is. It's really based wholly on a moral judgment about how upset you are, the things that you are doing when you behave, not some kind of a, a, a fine-tuned way to establish abnormality in that sense. With these kinds of things we're talking about, with real medicine, there is a way to define abnormality, and that is when the thing involved, so let's say hypertension, blood pressure, when the thing involved reaches a level where it interferes with physiological viability, then we call it abnormal and we wanna correct it so you get back into the normal range of blood pressure. But in our field, in the mental health field, there is no normal. It's just, it's, it's freewheeling medicalization of emotional distress and behavior. And who gets to decide how much uh, one should do or how sad one should be when they suffer the loss of a loved one? Each of us, the, the professionals, have the authority to make that decision, unfortunately. We don't rely on any kind of guideline. The DSM is not a guideline. 
uh, it actually allows us to just decide for ourselves what we think, what we feel is abnormal. We call it abnormal, but it's not abnormal. It's just uh, inappropriate in the, in the industry's mind. So that, that distinction is, uh, is really a, a ridiculous one, normal versus abnormal. But it is, it is true what the, uh, the person said was that we, we take understandable human reactions to things and we say that those are bad. And we say that you should be happy, you should be optimistic, you should look forward to life, you should be raring to go out and make your life happen. Well, that's just ridiculous. That isn't going to happen when things are going bad in your life. You're gonna feel rotten. And that's, that is not a problem. The problem is, is what do you do in response to feeling rotten? You know, do you hide, do you drink, do you take drugs, whatever, to get rid of the rotten feeling? Staying with the rotten feeling and tolerating it is the answer with the help of others. I have to piggyback on that because um, on a personal note, I'm going through the death of my service dog for 13 years. Like he's like my leg, you know what I'm saying? It's incredibly painful. And I can, I literally have cried so hard that I've been physically ill and like didn't want to get out of bed. I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know how long the process is going to last. I don't know if I have a day or a week or a month. Um, I'm lucky that it wasn't a shock. But as I'm going through this, not medicated, I'm, I'm learning a few things about this. That one, I see, I can totally see why someone will want to medicate this because it's so uncomfortable. Um, there hasn't been a lot of you know comments about like Angie, you know, you're crying too much, get over it, nothing like that. I have the most supportive community, probably because they know I do this work, to not say something like that. But that's to say, it's okay, call us anytime. So that human connection has been my bridge, you know? And, and I've even told people, I don't wanna talk. If I start talking, I'm gonna cry again, and then I'm gonna be, I might throw up. And they said, if you have to throw up, then throw up, you know? So, um, and then what was the other thing I was gonna say? Um, oh, that our society doesn't allow. You know, I've told my sister, like, I might be in bed for a month. Like that's how long this might take. I don't know. I can't put a I can't put a tag on it. He's been a part of my life for 13 years. More close to me than I, I cried more about this than I did about my own grandma. You know, so um, I think that you know we just do it ourselves a disservice when we you know give it a time limit or you know. But it it is incredibly like I just keep saying it's like a deep grief. Like it's primal. Like my cells and my soul itself is like suffering about this. And all I did yesterday was put a puzzle together and that was it. And like, it is what it is, you know what I mean? But we don't allow that process to happen, which I think is really sad that we just medicate this away, you know? Anybody else have anything to talk about medical, me normal versus abnormal? I just I just wanted to add to the trauma piece that, you know, especially for, um, I know we have someone from the Israeli forces on here and, and um, I don't know if we have any other um, veterans, but a lot of the times when people do um, operational things, they're traumatized by the things that have happened. Um, you know, they, they, they also have this idea, like, like you just suggested, I should be over it by now, or I shouldn't feel the way, the way that I feel. And they, they get messages about that from all over. And, you know, when, when you finally kind of break it down to them and say, okay, well, here's what happened. Like, how the hell else would you feel? You know, and if you felt any other way, you would actually be a monster you know, because of the, the, because of what happened to you or what you witnessed. Um, and, and when you put it to them that way, you know, they're, it's suddenly they're, you know, they're sitting up straight again and they're saying, well, yeah, you know, it just makes absolute logic sense, logical sense. And why was I buying this, you know, this crap? Um, and I also, for a lot of times with my grief, um, people I work with that are grieving, you know, I, I'll have to point out to them, you know, it's not that you shouldn't be grieving anymore. It's that the people around you are tired of you grieving. <laughs> And, and the encouragement to go to the psychiatrist is not about you, it's about them. They're sick of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's really all of a sudden the kind of this light bulb goes on and they say, yeah, like, I totally get that. You know, and I'll say, you know, the bottom line is the day that it's not going to bother you anymore that your wife died or that your child died is not coming. The day's not coming. Forget about it. Um, and, but the, the idea that you need to get over it is not for your comfort, it's for theirs. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have some questions about 
um, this might be a controversial topic. Let's see about time. We have about 15 minutes left. So if you have a question, now is the time to get it in. But let's talk about TMS, magnet therapy, psychedelics, MDMA, magic mushrooms, ketamine, all these uh, new things that are happening. What do you all think about those? Regarding the drugs, um, I think that one has to consider what's being asserted. And so for instance, psilocybin mushrooms are effective in treating depression, if that's the claim. All that says is if I get high, I'm gonna feel better. Um, and of course, that might help. That will work if that's what is wanted. If I get a prescription for medical marijuana, I'm gonna feel the effects of marijuana, it's euphoric. And so I'm gonna feel better. And if I do it daily, I'm probably gonna report that I feel better over time. The question is, is that, a, is that medicating a disease or illness? Or is it just the same thing that people do when they take heroin and uh, other kinds of illicit drugs? They're just using a substance to feel better. And if you use the substance repeatedly, obviously you're gonna have that effect if it feels good to you. Many people, however, as it was explained in the documentary, don't have good responses, don't, have, don't feel good with these drugs. Just like many people who take illicit drugs don't feel good with them. So it's not, um, you know, all these, all these otherwise illicit drugs are being marketed now as medications and they will come out just like marijuana has but don't misunderstand what's going on there uh, regarding the other things i'm not familiar with alpha stem and, and you know, trans oh, trans katie let me let me talk about the drug thing and then i'll, I'll bump it to you for the magnets because i because okay. you, you have to take the magnets off that list because uh, it's a separate issue but uh, you know one of the things we talk about at warfighter is that um you know people are getting rich every day of the year by perpetuating this idea that there is some substance out there that you can ingest in some way that is gonna solve your problems. It's gonna make you know, your trauma go away, your depression go away, your husband go away, um, you know, I'll make your marriage wonderful, whatever your situation is. Um, but there's, there is a substance out there and all you have to do is find it or the right combination of substances. But this is marketing. This is a money-making prophecy or pro prospect and the, the substance isn't out there. I, I mean, I agree completely with um, Dr. Ruby that, you know, you're, you can take those substances, but you're going to be numb or high. And, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a valid response if that's what you want. But it's, um, if, if your search for um, a better life is what, what you're trying to accomplish, you're, you're not going to find it by finding something to put into your body or add to your body. It's just not out there. So um, once you've tried all the holistic uh, activities, such as clean nutrition, exercise, fresh air, all of that, and, you're, and your brain is still having a difficult time, whether it's from medications you've been on or trauma or anything like that, neurofeedback is very methodically training your brain to self-regulate through a very gentle process. Neurofeedback puts no information into your brain whatsoever. Uh, there are different types of neurofeedback out there. The, what I do and what a lot of people are most familiar with is um, it's uh, electroencephalogram driven. So it's reading your brain waves real time live and then uh, teaching your brain through a verbal reward system and visual reward system on a computer to reward your brain every time the equipment senses that you're, you're in a very nice, even functioning keel of good, slow, deep breathing, relaxation, having your muscles relax head to toe and focused, but not hyper-focused because when we hyper-focus, we often hold our breath, clench our teeth, uh, clinch muscle groups, whatever. So it's just teaching it over time. So it is not an overnight success. It does take some time and you'll have to research with different providers, depending on the country you're from or the part of the country you're from, because different providers use different types, depending on their region and what they have available to them for support. So it's, it's just a very great 85% um, overall efficacy rate of success and it is not a cure, 
but it is a great reduction of the uncomfortable symptoms you are experiencing, such as lack of sleep, lack of focus, um, lack of being able to relax. So people feel really great uh, oftentimes when their sessions are complete. TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation that does the work for the brain. It is very powerful pulsing. Again, it has had success, but some people say they don't like it because it gives them a headache or it's just too much for their brain at once. It's doing the work for the brain. It is cumulative. It's just not training the brain like neurofeedback does. You've got all sorts of other devices like Dr. B mentioned alpha stem. Again, that's doing the work for the brain and it is cumulative. It just depends on what your brain is ready for and what your particular needs are. So I often will just consult with people and talk about their situation and give them their options of what might be best for them at that time in their situation, whether it's financially or a type of device or both. And I'll just say one thing about, um, I think the question before, like, do these treatments work should be, is there even a problem to begin with? Like we don't back up enough, you know what I mean? Right. So yeah. One, like, one, yeah. yeah. One of the things that I learned when coming off of this, it was like my head blew up. I read Bob Whitaker's book. I put it in the uh, comments, Anatomy and Epidemic. And I was like, oh my God, maybe I'm not mentally ill to begin with. Like, yeah. why would I just spend 15 years chasing this dragon that doesn't exist? Right. So I see it a lot in the veterans community that, you know, we try, they try this inpatient treatment, then they try this retreat, then they try this, um, you know, I don't know, for a year they'll do EFT or something. And then it's like, yeah. we just, we just go through this hamster wheel of chasing our own tails. And then what I've learned is like, stop chasing everything. Just be with yourself. Right. That's why I'm so adamant you know? about that intake consult of what's your daily life like, <laughs> and let's go from there. Yeah. Or, or I have a friend that says, um, if you find out what the problem is and fix the problem, like you're not the problem. The problem is the problem. That's what he said. <laughs> I'm like, that's brilliant. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> so anyway, okay. So let's do, let's see. Um, I'm trying to see, there's a long questions. One was a comment about an autistic son that the mom, the mom wants to medicate. The dad does not. And I can just tell you that I've seen a lot of this in our screenings where uh, the psychiatry comes between the family where half of the family believes in it. The other half of the family is, you know, not, um, the earlier comment about somebody with psychosis from cannabis. I've seen a lot of that in our community doing these screenings. It happens more often than you would know. Um, let's see what this one says. This person's commenting about, it's hard to know. And I'm sure because we have two therapists on the panel, maybe you could, um, talk about this how do you know the difference between what is the original problem and what's a drug effect? Like, how do you all know what you're treating? Because well, yeah. personally, I don't treat anybody because um, I'm not a medical professional and there's no illness to treat, first off. Uh, so when I work with somebody, I'm not focusing on, I'm not focusing that way that I'm trying to treat them that um, I wouldn't know well, I could speculate what the difference is between what they're originally dealing with and what a drug might be causing, but I would never know for sure uh, until they might decide to quit taking the drug. And then we would find out later. But then again, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're flowing human processes. We're not stagnant things so that what I was yesterday is the same I, as I am today. I'm always changing. So down the road, if they stop having one of these problems, it doesn't necessarily mean I took it away through therapy or the drug was stopped and so the problem stopped or what happened if they did it on their own. So I, I guess maybe in a way, I don't, I don't think you'd know which is which unless you stop the drug. Angie, when you stopped, you could tell things changed and it was a huge transition between pre uh, times and now. And it takes a long time to get, to get those problems to go away. But then new problems take their place. You know, the problem of now I can feel in the, in the world. I can feel what pain is like, and you got to deal with that. And you weren't feeling that before. Um, so anyways, that's, that's my comment on that. Mary? So um, I think, um, you know, I, I, as far as the psychiatry coming between uh, husband and wife over a child, I see that 
Um, I've also sat with a family who, um, you know, with the, the parent that wanted the, the drugging one, and then the child committed suicide shortly after that, you know, and so they lost a kid that was 12, um, you know, to, to gun violence. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I do, I, and that's happened more than once where, you know, they, they fought the, the kid that ultimately went on the medication. Now they don't have a kid. Um, so I just, I can never see that as a, as a, as a win um, for the parent who wins. Um, so, you know, that's one piece of it. But the other thing is that, again, the, the psychiatric d labels that we're talking about, the, 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 none of them are real. You know, whether you're talking about bipolar, you're talking about autism, you're talking about Asperger's, you know, any of those things, none of those things are real. They're, they're just um, what, what uh, Fran uh, Dr. Francis in the, in the film, he was, he was as honest as he could be about that. He said, these are definitions. Of our, we, we made up the categories and we defined them. And he said that very, very clearly. And he's the, the managing editor of the book. So um, people should take that to heart, that this is just a description of human um, uh, variation. And you know, you're, so you're, if your child um, is different um, in very difficult ways, that, that's all they are is different in very difficult ways. And there's just no chance that, um, putting a neurotoxic substance into that child's brain is going to um, make that go away or make that better somehow. So um, I've, I've seen the tragedy over and over and over. And I got to be honest with you. Um, this is one of the things that motivates me to get up every morning is uh, just not wanting to see it anymore. Um, I also, I, I have a, a little bit of an answer to your question about what came first because one of the things I, I do with my clients sometimes if they're good historians is I'll plot their problems and then I'll go back and get their medical record and plot out their medications on top of their problem you know, timeline. And, and then the next time they come in, I, after I've taken the time to do this, I'll present it to them and, and you can see the, the deterioration um, was it was you know I had this problem and then I exponentially declined and it's all you know based on these drugs and um, so and it's very motivating then of course for them to um, to see that at, at their the moment they presented life really wasn't that bad um, and it just got worse and worse and so they, they realized that they can get back up to that place as people on the panel have uh, shown us it's not it's not it's not easy now you have two problems your original problem plus your um, painful withdrawal problem but it is possible to see it I guess is what I'm saying um, and I and most providers I don't think are as geeky as that and are going to spend the time um, <laughs> to, to plot that out to show you um, what happened but it's it's fascinating when you do it that kind of um, sets us up for this last question. This person is talking about um, they're a military veteran with trauma from military sexual trauma. Well, they didn't say they said military trauma, so I'm not sure. But um, so let's just let's just talk about the veteran community who have military trauma, whether it be um, rape or sexual assault or combat or maybe a training accident or whatever. But then they also have trauma from childhood. And then they might have trauma when they get out, they might have experienced drug addiction, homelessness, you know, all these complex things. The person's kind of commenting about um, they felt a lot better doing ACT, CBT, MBCBT, and compassionate mind, all the lettered <laughs> therapies, um, but that they were finally able to feel something for the first time, you know. So can you, they, they kind of want to know, you know, how do you, manage that when you have multiple traumas through your life we don't really know a lot about trauma we're just learning you know but it's it seems to be a growing trend now trauma-informed care trauma you know all these trauma things so can we talk about trauma and kind of within the veteran community you want to talk first chuck uh you're probably <clears throat> probably better than me at this <clears throat> So I, I guess um, going to the, to the alphabet soup of therapies, I, the, the, one of the things we teach at Warfighter Advance is that um, military members in particular um, learn this skill starting in the first day of boot camp about how to um, analyze a risk benefit ratio and how to look at a, a, a thing in the world and say, 
you know, what are the risks? What are the benefits? You know, should I proceed? Um, you know, is this hill worth taking at all? And um, so we ask that the, to, when they're looking at therapies or looking at things that people ask, say, hey, you know, you should try this, you know, how about some ketamine or, you know, um, how about some Klonopin, whatever it is, you know, look at the look at the potential risk versus what the potential benefit is. And so, you know, when you when you realize that no one's ever died of anxiety, but lots of people die of psych meds, then all of a sudden that risk benefit ratio is something that um, it just becomes very, very clear very quickly. But some of those alphabet soup therapies, I don't know if they work. Lots of people swear by the ART therapies or the EMDR therapies, they swear by them. Um, but if you look at the, the essence of those therapies, um, the way I see it is, you know, they might help, but they're certainly not going to hurt you. So mm -hmm. give it a whirl, it, you know, and obviously the, the person who sent in that question has had some benefit from some of them. And, you know, I, I think it's okay to try things like that. Um, it's kind of like with yoga, you know, I mean, you, maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't, but it's not going to hurt you to try. Um, but, the, you know, the Prozac could be the, you know, the, the last thing you ever do. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, that's the, the main thing, you know, about that. As far as lifelong trauma, I think, you know, again, you get into this trap that somehow you've got to, um, you've got to turn it off. You've got to end it. And I mean, end the pain of your, of your trauma. And I feel, I feel more like, the paradigm should be figuring out a way to take it with you. I mean, I know the things that Kathleen has been through, for example, they're not gone. Um, they're still in her heart, um, but she's figured out a way to, to carry them with her in, and, and make it look very graceful. And, you know, and I think that's what you have to hope for. Not, not that somehow, you know, we're going to make Iraq go away or, um, you know, make that training accident go away. It's just, it, it, it's not a reasonable thing. Life is painful and, um, you know, you, you got to figure out a way to, to, to deal with it and keep moving. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. The, the, mod, the conventional model with trauma, and by the way, life is trauma. The, it, there's little traumas and there's huge traumas and they're always happening every day of our lives. There's some kind of traumatic thing, some disruption in our life. But the, the conventional model has been one of Something happens, I have a memory, an experience and a memory of something. And my job is to try to work to take that thing and get rid of it and then move forward in life. And the model should be the opposite. It should be, you're going along your path in life and you encounter trauma. The idea is to take it with you, to grab onto it, embrace it somehow, find meaning in it, um, not try to push it off to the side, hide it, keep it a secret give it some meaning, but it's part of you now. You can't get rid of, in fact, we wouldn't want you to get rid of the memory of some things. Uh, that's actually thought to be a bad thing in psychiatry, a dissociative uh, experience. So um, again, the model should be to, to take this thing and, and embrace it and bring it with you going forward in your life, hopefully finding meaning for it, a lesson or a greater appreciation for life or other things like that. That was beautiful. Um, there was a couple comments. I just want to make this comment um, leaving, coming off of that about, you know, do you have specific treatments for this disorder or specific for that disorder? And I just want to caution that we at Medicaid Normal, at least, we try not to give like prescriptive, like do this for you and this is going to fix you because isn't that kind of what, how we all got here? <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I just want to say, I'm not going to ask those questions only because it's a personal journey you know, find things that hurt less, obviously, but I don't want to give any specific, like, boom, this is going to fix you because, you know, it's, it's so unique for everyone. So let's just take the time to give any final comments, anything that moved you that you want to say more about. Um, also tell us where we can find you. There's people asking about neurofeedback, you know, specifically. Um, so just plug your, plug yourself, your organization, whatever you, you want to say, your last thing, last thoughts, take as long as you need. We have about 10 minutes. Go ahead, whoever goes first. I'll go first. Okay. Uh, quick piggyback on what you just said about the kinds of therapies, all these different forms of therapies, DBT, EMDR, ACT, you know, I wanna say M-O-U-S-E, but <laughs> they're all really just different forms of the same thing. 
Um, someone finds, someone takes DBT and they put a little spin on it and they call it ADBT and they can write a book and they can market this new treatment. They're all the same thing. They're all basically psychodynamic cognitive behavioral kinds of interventions to help people explore and understand problems they have. Um, so don't get hung up on the, you know, finding the latest and greatest form of, of treatment. Um, I think, I think one of the biggest things to remember about this whole issue is that these problems that we call mental illness, that the conventional system calls mental illness, aren't really illnesses or diseases. The, the term illness in that phrase is a figurative use of the term. Unfortunately, most people, probably the people on the call tonight, uh, believe it as a real illness, like something's wrong either in your brain, a brain disease, or some kind of strange illness of the mind, which doesn't make sense logically, but some kind of strange illness, but it's not. None of this stuff has to do with disease, illness, or medicine, and that's the problem because the medical model is applied to these problems. It would be like um, if we say we have a lot of political ills in our country, which we do right now, that we should call a doctor to go fix those things. That would be ridiculous, but that's the same thing that's going on within the conventional mental health system is we have a personal, spiritual, political, economic, existential problem in our lives, and we're trying to get a medical doctor to fix that. It doesn't make sense. Um, I'm glad to be on, the, on the, uh, the panel tonight. It was fun. And if anyone's interested in my book, it's Smoke and Mirrors, How You're Being Fooled About Mental Illness. And you can get it on any of the, the typical retail outlets for books. Um, if you want to uh, hear more about me, I have an individual webpage, chuckruby.com. You could also go to the International Society for Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry webpage, which is either isepp.com or psychintegrity.org. Uh, and uh, you can contact me through either one of those sites and um, wish you all the best. I'll go. You. go ahead, I'm going to go last. Okay. Do you want me to go? Okay. So um, I am terrible. I've been saying for years, I'll make a website. I have yet to do it because I'm so word of mouth. <laughs> and I um, raised three children with my husband who was deployed off and on through that time. So I never just made my practice huge or anything like that. But if you are you able to type in my email address, Angie, I am happy to speak with any of you or answer questions. Um, individually because it is so individualized for uh, neurofeedback or any of these other um, types of uh, devices. So that makes it a lot easier that way. Um, I uh, would also like to say, be very careful with your children and labels. I know because of our son that sometimes we feel it is absolutely necessary that they, they have some sort of diagnosis because of accommodations in the school setting. Um, I understand that firsthand as a former special education teacher and of a mom who, you know, our son had these uh, brain injuries, but uh, we actually had all of any label on his records um, struck out of his records because it can really come back and bite them in the future, uh, depending on what type of career they go into. He very much wanted a career in the military. He lived, ate, and breathed military history, could tell you anything. Whether he was a good candidate for the military, I don't know. But thankfully, he has now found his niche with um, EMT and into paramedics. But you do want to be very careful because the military, especially if the parents are military, they can go into your records. You're an open book all the way back into early elementary. And uh, there's a large chance that your child will not get into the military, depending on if we're at peace or at war. Uh, the rules change frequently. And especially with medications, uh, records of therapy, all of that. So when clients come to me, I do not, um, I don't diagnose myself because I don't have a, a clinical background, but um, I, I, there are no records. Um, so that if someone comes through and they're just experiencing some stress or 
when school shootings were happening and kids weren't sleeping and they were terrified. I saw a lot of students through that time frame, um, but nothing was ever written in any formal record. So think about that. Also think about if it if a teacher or a school is pushing you to put your child on medication while they're in school, it's illegal to do that. Reach out to an advocate or someone to help you navigate that process. They cannot make you put your child on medication just because your child cannot sit still in class. Other accommodations need to be made and there are plenty of ways to work with that. So I'm happy to um, talk to anyone about that as well. And thank you for having me tonight. Kathleen? Um, yes, thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. I teach yoga not as much now during COVID because there's too many rules and restrictions, but I'm always happy if you want to put my email out there to help people find the what's right for them in their town, especially if you're outside of Southern Maryland. I'm always happy to reach out to yoga studios or to gyms and find a good fit you know, for anyone who is thinking about starting an exercise routine or working with a personal trainer, um, from a biostatistician's point of view, the medications terrify me when I look at the numbers and the studies. And I encourage you, you know, if you want to research every medication and how it interacts with every other medication, there are a lot of really great sites through National Institutes of Mental Health that will you know, they even kind of debunk a lot of the treatments that they are working on prescribing. So it's very, in you know, it's kind of, the more I've gotten into and introduced to this through Warfighter and through Dr. Veaton, the more I've realized, you know, they're contradicting themselves at the same institution. And, and so that's kind of interesting as well. You know, even if you look at Johns Hopkins or, you know, Shepherd Pratt, which is a big psychiatric hospital in Maryland, like their treatment is contradicting their research. So it's just, it's, it's interesting when you look at the medication piece. I will say that the one thing Doc V hits on a lot at Warfighter is unconditional positive regard in listening to someone and not listening to give an answer, not listening, thinking about what you're gonna say, but just listening with unconditional positive regard. And if you can do that for one person who is suffering trauma, grief, loss, being sad, God bless you. <laughs> That's a good thing. And again, email me if you have any questions about exercise or where's the right place for you to train and start getting your brain moving and happier with lots of positive rewards. Thank you, Kathleen. And Dr. V, you want to close us out? Yes, I want to um, circle back to the organization that Chuck Ruby mentioned, the International Society for Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry. There are ethical people out there. Um, if you're a provider and you are looking for a home um, where you can um, be with other people and uh, learn with other people who want to do uh, the, this kind of help, you know, the helping professions in a humane way and um, outside of the psych, uh, psychiatric or medical model, um, that, could, that could be a home for you. And um, so I hope you'll look it up and see what it's all about. Um, and um, as far as the organization that I <laughs> have here, um, yes, that we're all, all a part of Warfighter Advance. It's um, www.warfighteradvance.org um, for veterans who are traumatized or trying to get off the psych meds, want a different way. Um, the program is free door to door. Um, so um, we'd like to hear from you and um, uh, there's a lot of information about our philosophy and what we do on our website. Um, we're also, um, there's a donate button on there. So I can't resist saying that if you have a couple of extra shekels and or shenanigans laying around in your abode, feel free to hit that donate button and uh, help us out because the uh, warfighters do not pay for that program. Um, and uh, it's, it is not free to operate, it's just free to them. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. I'll just say a couple words about the film really quick. Um, we have a YouTube channel with over 100 and 
30 videos now. Uh, most of them are short little clips that are easy, you know, things about the chemical imbalance theory or antidepressants or anxiety and withdrawal and all these other things. We have a website with research listed that you can read, resources, a reading list of many of the books that were mentioned tonight and websites. Um, and lastly, uh, if you know another organization that would like to do a screening and panel like this one, please email us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. And again, our website is medicatingnormal.com. So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the insightful discussion and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.